Hey guys, good morning. Welcome to church this morning. Uh, thank you guys for joining us online. Um, so a couple of announcements before we start. Just wanted to say thank you um, to everyone who has um, been helping us out, volunteering, um, even sending us snacks and uh, different things that we need for uh, the move. Um, everything is going great down there. We're making a ton of, uh, ton of progress on the new building. Um, we still need a lot of volunteers. So with that, uh, if you guys would like to serve um, in any capacity, well, we're going to be officially starting our move this week. Uh, still need some, um, some more manpower with that. We'd love to get you guys connected. But on our website, uh, ccfallbrook.com, there's a way to get connected there and uh, different areas and different ways to serve. So um, that being said, also, um, with this week and these upcoming weeks coming up, um, if there uh, is, uh, if you guys could please, uh, through that, sorry, I'm like battling a, like a migraine right now. If there's anything that, that you can do to um, help serve, please contact uh, any one of our staff, me, Teresa, and uh, we would love to get you guys connected with that also. So, um also, too, with the tithe, there's so many different ways to give and support our church. Um, obviously, there's the tithe boxes outside. Um, and then also, too, online, there is a give link um, there where you guys can uh, do your tithe online. And also, there's reoccurring giving that you can um, get set up as well. So if you guys could please uh, also, too, every single week, please continue to join with us in prayer and fasting. Um, God is doing a great work through our church and more importantly is going to use us mightily um, in this city and town of Fallbrook as we transition to our new building. So please continue to join us in prayer and fasting every week. So if you guys have your Bibles, please open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 2. We are going to be starting um, um, this beautiful Christmas season. Can I get an amen? amen. Um, and this first weekend celebrating Advent, we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 2, and we're going to be in verses 1 through 5. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amoz, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and shall be lifted up above the hills, and all the nations shall flow to it, and many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that may we, we may walk in his paths. For out of, Zion shall, out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and shall decide disputes for many peoples. And they shall bear their swords and plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Please join your hearts with me as we pray this morning. Lord Jesus, we come before you, and we thank you, Lord, for giving us this opportunity to come to this place to celebrate you, to celebrate this beautiful season of Advent, and more importantly, Christmas the true gift, Jesus Christ, to this earth, to us, to be born, but more importantly, Lord, to die for us. So Jesus, we just thank you, Lord, for everything that you are doing through our church, Lord, through our, through the beautiful servants and families that are represented here. We pray, Father, for your spirit to fall upon us this morning as we praise and we worship you. And Lord, for this season of Advent, for this season of, of Christmas that we celebrate, Lord. We pray, Father, for the people who don't know you, Jesus, as Savior and Lord. Let this Christmas season be the season where they receive that true gift, the gift of Jesus Christ, their Savior, their God. Peace, hope, love, grace, and mercy. That's what Christmas is about. So, Lord, prepare our hearts, Lord, to sing out to you, to worship you. And, Lord, may your spirit fall upon this beautiful town of Fallbrook. Lord, let this, this place, this church, Lord, bless you. So, Lord, use us to bless you, Lord. Use us to, to be vessels for you. 
Use us to be a light in this community. We love you. We praise you. We thank you. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's all stand. We are grateful to be here, God, on this, on this Sunday morning. God, we're grateful for all that you've done for us. 
we're grateful that, uh, God, we can take this time during the season to just to show you honor, God, as uh, a church, a community, and, you know, God, as a nation. I mean, that's what the celebration of Christmas is about. God, I pray that for our nation this season that um, it would be, God, that we as a nation would remember what this season is about and that it's not about um, getting presents or what have you, but it is, Jesus, about you and you coming to this earth to light the way, to show us um, that we need a Savior and to not just to show us what we need, but to be what we need. Um, God, we are grateful and thankful. We give you this morning. We invite your spirit here. It's in Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen.
Lighting up my faith, lighting up my one with your endless grace. Lighting up my fears, lighting up my fears, and everything I've carried over all these years. Sing it again. You lighting up my future. You lighting up my faith. You lighting up my wonder with endless grace. You lighting up my fears. You lighting up my fears. And everything I've carried over all these years. You light. The way you light the way with a fire by night and a cloud by day, you light the way you light the way where you go, I go, where you stay, I stay. sinless life, God. Jesus, you live perfectly. You died for our sins. We can come to you. We can lay all our burdens at your feet. We can take our sinful lives and give them to you and you'll change us. given us a future and a hope. Whatever failures we deal with, whatever failures that happen to us in this life, because of your perfect life, and thankful that we can lay those things, all of our failures, God, all the, you know, all of our problems, all of our issues, that we can lay them at your feet and that, um, Jesus, you are faithful to meet us in those, you know, failures and in those problems and in those difficulties that we go through and that you prove yourself faithful to be with us in the midst of those things. We love you. We thank you. We're grateful and thankful again that we have this season to celebrate you and that uh, we can know that you have done those things that's needed to uh, give us new life. We're grateful that you came into the world and were born. Um, that Jesus, you were a helpless baby. That 
you lived that perfect life and that you were worthy to, to die for our sins. You were that perfect sacrifice. So we give you all the honor and all the glory and all the praise this morning.
God with us. Light has come. God with us. We love you, Lord. We're thankful for this morning again, God. We just desire you more than, than life itself. God, may that be, may you be our greatest desire. May we really, truly um, desire you more than anything. And God, may it not just be a, a seasonal thing, but may it be a daily, minutely thing. Um, God, we invite you in this place again, and we just desire to see you move. And God, that's why we're here. We're here for you. We're here desiring to hear from you, desiring to, to know you more, desiring to draw near, desiring to go deeper. So as we sing our last song this morning, God, may that take place.
you for this morning. God, we give you our hearts, our lives again. God, may it be, sometimes it needs to be, uh, it feels like a daily, hourly, minutely thing that we, recom- we are recommitting to you constantly. But Jesus, thank you so much that you are ever with us, ever walking with us, leading us, guiding us, drawing us near. Um, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. We give you this morning. God, may your spirit just be poured out again in this place. And God, may we learn. May we learn from you. And may we fall more in love with you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Take a minute to greet each other in the Lord, especially somebody that you've never met before. All right. All right. Good morning, everybody. It don't matter. I told Teresa to, do you guys do like staff emails? Next. If there are, if there are those, that way I know. No, it's not your fault. All right, let's get seated. Did everybody have a good Thanksgiving? Yeah, good, good, good food, good fellowship, I hope. (laughs) All right. Well, believe it or not, uh, this Sunday is the first Sunday of Advent. First, can you believe it? We're four Sundays away from Christmas, that means. That's what it means in layman's terms. We're four weeks out of Christmas. But as we always do here at the church, we always want to recognize that and celebrate it. So we have Mario's beautiful family up here. Um, be careful with the lighter. All right. Okay. Give it to Zeke. <laughs> Hi, guys. Good morning. So today is the first Sunday of Advent, the prophecy candle. Um, our circle of light begins with the prophecy candle. The prophet Isaiah lived hundreds of years before Jesus was born, and he wrote of the coming birth of Christ. Isaiah lived in a time when people felt fearful about wars, and there was much hatred in the world. God himself communicated to Isaiah that a better time was coming, 
a time when the Messiah would come to bring peace and love. And so the prophet wrote these words from God. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. In those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Isaiah 9-2. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Isaiah 9-6. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and he will be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. Isaiah 7-14. This was God's birth announcement for Jesus. Most announcements for babies are sent after the child has been born. This announcement has, about Jesus was sent to the world 750 years before the birth of Christ. So we light our first candle, the... Prophet's candle. Prophecy candle. Prophecy candle. <laughs> Imagine it doesn't light. Oh, this one? The icon it's already lit. Oh, that's it's a torch lighter. Oh, that's fancy. <laughs> Good job. Good job. Of course, Zeke was the highlight. <laughs> yeah, so this next four weeks, we're going to be doing exactly what Advent is about, you know, and I, and I really think of, as we look at this last year, it's been emotionally very exhausting and very trying for many of us, whether it be our health or the loss of work to some of our family or friends. Um, my good friend back in Brooklyn, he's lost, I think, five or six friends to COVID, and he's only in his 30s, so he's, it's not about the age. It attacks, it attacks, and it, it really is harmful, obviously. And um, so as we go to prayer, one of the things about Advent is to look back on prophecy of Jesus, and it's to look forward to the coming of Jesus. So as they read this morning, we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 2, but if we're in the middle of that, right? Where we, he has come, the light has come into the world, and now we wait for his return. But in the meantime, and, and I was talking to someone last week, and it was really, really sweet what she says. She goes, you know, we've been chosen for this time. We've been chosen to go through this time. And what a responsibility that is. What an opportunity that is. And I think sometimes we get discouraged. We get, you know, um, we get lost in, in the minutia of everything that's going on around us. And we lose sight of the light has come into the world. Because see, that light has come into the world to shed light on our lives right now to give us purpose, to give us a proper value system, to see the world around us, not as divided camps, but as those who our Savior has come to die for and to save. And now we have this great good news and that our kingdom is a kingdom that does not shake. And I, and I want to remind us of that. And as we look here this morning, I'm just going to read um, briefly out of Psalm 46. Just the very end there. Um, we'll start in verse 4. It says, there is a river whose stream make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God, God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob, our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord. How he has brought desolation on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I'll be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Let's bow our hearts in prayer as we get ready for the message this morning. Holy Father, as we come before you this morning, we want to pause. We want to be still. 
And we want to be reminded that you are God. And there is none like you. And even as the sons of Korah reminded us this morning, the Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob. He is our refuge. And Lord, we rest in that refuge because of what Christ has done. Our sin, Lord, it, it stains us, it dirties us, it manufactures within us guilt and shame. And yet you don't want us to stay there. You want us to hear once again the words of your gospel that all who believe shall be saved. And Lord, and as we recognize our sin, we also recognize your perfect work and your pronouncement from the cross, it is finished. Our debt's been paid in full. And as we confess to you in the quietness of our own hearts, as we see you as Isaiah did, seated upon your throne, Lord, we recognize it is the blood of the Lamb that cleanses us. It is the blood of the Lamb that washes us anew. And it's your work and your invitation now that invites us into your throne room of grace to intercede, to stand in the gap, and to mind the gap, Lord, for those around us. And that's what we do now, Lord. We continue, Lord, to come before you with our nation, the place you have allowed us to live and to be born in. And Lord, we pray for your leading and your guidance to our leaders, uh, to our president, to our Supreme Court justices, uh, to the governors and mayors throughout the land, that you would give them a divine wisdom and that you give, help them to humble themselves before you that they would do what's right in your eyes, and that, as we will see this morning, Lord, righteousness and truth are the foundations of your throne. And Lord, we, Lord, would live in that. We pray that for our nation, righteousness and truth, and for the nations of the world. And Lord, um, we continue to pray for those that are ill among us. Uh, we think of Connie Sanchez, Lord. We think of those that are at home um, that have suffered that, Lord, you'd bless them and that you would keep them and you'd make your face to shine upon them. Lord, we lift up our missionaries throughout the world. Um, we pray your blessing upon them, that you would lead them to the white fields and that they'd be ready for harvest, that you would provide all their needs, both spiritual, emotional, and physical. We pray, Lord, that you would give them favor with those they need favor with and that your gospel would go forth. We pray for, Lord, the 1040 window especially for our brothers and sisters there that suffer even death for the name of Jesus, that you would embolden the church, that you would pour out your spirit upon the church there, and that you'd anoint, Lord, the congregations and their leaders, Lord, to continue to shine your light in a dark world. Father, we lift up our marriages to you. We pray for just a, a fresh uh, a rekindling, Lord, a renewal of just thankfulness, Lord, for our spouses, thankfulness for our children. Um, even those, Lord, we struggle with, and Lord, maybe those that maybe don't know you yet. We pray, Father, for those that have walked away and those that don't know you, that you would lead them to yourself and that you would save them, Lord, and that the seeds that have been planted in their hearts would take root, and, and Lord, and they would grow and they'd bear fruit for you. Um, Lord, we pray for wisdom in raising our children. We pray for wisdom as we volunteer in Sunday school, Lord, that we would show them Jesus and that they would love you, Father. We Pray, Lord, for the churches in the valley that you would bless them this morning as they gather, as they sing your praises, as they hear your word, and as they celebrate communion. Be with our brothers and sisters and bless their gathering times also. Father, we continue to pray for wisdom as we move into the new building. Help us to accomplish all the tasks that you've laid before us, Lord, and uh, provide everything we need, as you always have. And we thank you for that, Lord. But we do pray now that you would send us your Holy Spirit, that he would guide us into all truth that you meet us at your communion table at the end of service, Lord, and that you'd restore the downcast and that you would heal the brokenhearted. We invite you, Holy Spirit, to meet each person here this morning right where they're at and speak to them the words they need to hear and remind them once again that they've been chosen from the foundations of the world. Lord, we pray you be glorified in this time. Guide us into all truth, we pray. Illuminate our eyes. Rekindle our hearts. For Father, we ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. Amen. Yeah, it's a hearty amen. I'll take it. If you go with me, you can open up to Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2, we're going to just take a look at the first five verses. And again, as we look at Advent, it's a time in the church calendar 
that marks, right, marks the season that we begin to prepare ourselves to celebrate Christmas. It's, and it's a time where we come before the Lord and we, and we have this expectation in our waiting, and, I, and our expectation and our waiting. And I really want to focus on that, just that one word for just a second, expectation. When's the last time you were in an in, in, in expectant mood, right? I think back to when I was a kid, this is when it started for me. The first Sunday that our family lit the candle, that was the fuse, only four more Sundays to go, right? And it's Christmas time. And I was getting pumped. We got the tree up. We get the nativity scene in the front yard. You know, the whole house would get decorated. And that would, as a child, you just build and build. And then mom would slowly begin to bring out the presents. And as we got older, she wouldn't bring out the presents to the last, last, last week. And why? Because we would peek. We would. We would peek. We would figure out ways to unwrap it without her knowing, but she always knew. So she waited. But again, it's this idea of, of we prepare ourselves for the Christ. And then here's the other thing. We renew our hearts in the expectation of his eminent return. You know, again, I think sometimes we don't live in that reality. We don't allow ourselves to look forward again. And I don't want to be looking for the Antichrist. I don't want to be looking for signs of the end times. No, I want to be looking for Jesus. I'm not looking for all the things that are supposed to take place. I prepare my heart for when I will stand before him and give account. That's what I'm preparing myself. I look forward to that day. And as Peter says, he brings grace with him. Which thank the Lord for that. But again, we want to, at the, end of the, at the end of this year, we're closing out this year, 2020, and I think we all would say amen, right? Get 2020 behind us. But we're closing out the year, and I think it's a time for us to reflect. I really do. It's a time for us to take you know, inventory of our lives, to take inventory of our hearts, and am I living in the expectation? Am I living in the reality that the Messiah has come? And am I living in the reality that he is going to come back? Am I living for his kingdom? Am I living to build and to glorify him where I am and in what I'm doing? These are the things we want to check ourselves in at this time of year. And I think it's a good thing. Because the one thing about winter, everything dies in winter, right? Well, Southern California... Is hit and miss. But any, any part of the country where there's four seasons, right, in a, in a normal year, 2020 is not a normal year, but in other normal years, everything dies. I remember being in Hungary, and I mean, I wasn't used to four seasons. I'm a Southern California boy. Four seasons was like we wore a sweater in December, right? That was winter, and then summer came right back in February. <laughs> But man, when I was in Hungary, we had four seasons. And I remember in the dead of winter, like January and February, everything's dead. You can see every branch, every twig on the branches, and there's no green. The fields are all dead. Everything is brown. And you wait for the color of spring. But it's a reminder we are mortal. It's a reminder that everything has its due season. And the thing about it is we got to be reminded that our lives are not to be taken for granted, and especially the gift of the Messiah. And I think sometimes as believers, we take him for granted, don't we? If we're honest, if I'm honest. So as we look at Isaiah today, again, we look back, we look back on the Old Testament. And as Teresa said, she gave the introduction for the Isaiah. He's about 750, 735 years before Christ. They call him the, the prophet poet because if you read Isaiah, it's just full of poetry and uh, just, uh, it's really artistic, it's beautiful in how he communicates himself. The early church, I want you guys to understand this, the early church obviously didn't have the gospels, right? They didn't have the letters of Paul yet. They were still in, in infancy. But you know what book they loved to read? The book of Isaiah. Because you know what they found in Isaiah? Jesus He's all over the place in the book of Isaiah. They love to read it. They love, why? Because when they look at the prophecies of Isaiah, they said, we are living in the fulfillment of those prophecies. We're living in the reality of what Isaiah saw 750 years before the Messiah came, where they are living in that reality, and it was beautiful to them. So they call it the fifth gospel, but if they want to be right in, in their um, order of things, they would say it's the first gospel. 
because they saw so much Jesus there. It was the early church's favorite book. And as we look back on the Old Testament, I would encourage you, if you read the Old Testament, January's coming. That means we, if you guys are reading the Bible in a year, you're starting in Genesis again. I would encourage you, look for Jesus. Because in the Old Testament, remember this, he is the fulfillment. He is the fulfillment of the Old Testament, isn't he? As, as Hebrews tells us, he's the shadow of things to come as the Old Testament. The fulfillment is the New Testament. And that fulfillment is Jesus, the Messiah. That's what the whole Old Testament's all about. It's about Jesus. So as we look here this morning, keep that in mind. Let's look for Jesus. How do we live our lives in the reality that he has come, that Messiah has come? As we look back on the nativity, it is God who is there, Emmanuel, God with us. And I love what one, this one person said. He just says, God gives us God. And, when we, and we all only need to slow down long enough to unwrap the greatest gift. With our time, time in his word, time in his presence, time at his feet, we begin to unwrap the gift of the Messiah that God has given us. So in Isaiah chapter 2, starting there in verse 1, it says, The word of the Lord, the word that Isaiah, the son of Amoz, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And I want you to keep in mind, Judah is going, remember, it's the southern kingdom. Only Benjamin is with Judah at this time. The northern kingdoms have been exiled. They're gone, right? Judgment hasn't come. And so he's speaking to Judah and Benjamin, and there's been a remnant of worship, true worship, to God, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But there's this time in Isaiah's period where he's speaking prophecy, where there's an abundance of wealth. They're living very comfortably. They're living in light of Solomon's beautiful temple. And they're taking, they're taking God for granted. They are not living out the law. They are not loving their neighbor as themselves. They're kind of just going through the motions of temple worship. And so Isaiah sees this, and by the Spirit of God coming upon him, he begins to prophesy to them. And he begins to tell them, you think judgment's done? Judgment's coming. If we don't repent, if we don't turn, if we don't come back to the God of our fathers, God's going to judge. Wake up, he tells them. But here in, in chapter 2, he points them forward to a day when God will be with us. Let's read it together. It says, and it shall come to pass in latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that we may teach, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes of, for many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. So he looks to a day where the mountain of the Lord is established on the earth. And the thing I want us to see, again, if we're looking for Jesus, I really want to point to this word established. Established. It means to stand firm. It means to be unshakable. And I think as we live, look at this last year, everything's been shaken. Everything, politically, economically, shaken. Everything that we put our trust in, right? Everything that we hope in. Every distraction has been shaken. And not just here in the United States, not just here in California, but all over the world. I talk to my friends in Europe. They're going through the same things, even more stringent than here. Way more. In Hungary, same thing. My friends in Germany, same thing. So the whole world is being shaken by this invisible germ that the naked eye cannot see, this enemy that's coming, right? And causing this panic, this fear, this Total fear where we are frozen for many people in that fear. And it's around us. So the kings of this world are always going to shake. They're always going to totter. They're always going to be unreliable. But yet, so often, what we do is we put our faith in them. We put our faith in officials. 
in this country that can only be in office for eight years maximum for the presidency, right? And we hope, we hope for that eight years, but then we got to do it again after eight years or after four years. But still, we put our hope there and it's shakable. And for some reason, we ignore the shaking. I mean, if you're raised in Southern California, do you even wake up for earthquakes anymore? Nah, you sleep through them unless they're a big one, right? I remember, I think it was what, 91? We had this massive earthquake. Remember, it took down the freeways and all this stuff. I remember my, I slept right underneath the window. And I woke up and the window was going, whoa, 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 whoa. And I went, ah, it's just another earthquake. And I was going back to sleep. But then something inside of me said, if that window breaks, you're going to have to get plastic surgery. Because it's going to fall flat on your face, right? So I got up really quick. And the whole place was just going back and forth. But if you're from Southern California, do you even get scared anymore? I just kind of, well, we'll see how long this one lasts. Wow, that was a long one, a whole minute. Woo, that was long. And then what did we do? We go back to sleep. But people from another state come here, and this earth starts to shake. They flip out. Oh, my gosh, it's the end of the world. Why? They never experienced that before. A man and I were in Omaha, Nebraska. The tornado sirens would go off every Saturday. And a man and I would look at each other like, <gasps> look in the sky, and, you know, where's the tornado coming from? It's just, a, it's just an alarm. It's just a test. And everybody else would look at us like, newbies. Newbies, you're not from here, are you? What gave us away, you know? Because they're not even affected by that. But I fear this in the same way. In the same way. We live our lives almost in the sense of being dull to hearing the word. And we read it last week. I've been thinking about it. They no longer tremble at my word. We, we forget that it's the living God who has given us this word. The living God. A God who's alive and active. And I remember I told you, oh, by the way, I got to tell you guys this. I was going to say this before, but I'll say it now because it kind of goes along with this, this reminding of my friend's dad. But hey, Sevy rang the bell this week. His last chemo session. And it's behind him now. It was a big day. A big day for us. I thought he was going to tear that bell off the hook. He was hitting it so hard. But it's a glorious day. But after his first, I think it was probably after the first six months, he was doing, you know, he was recovering. He still had a lot of weight loss and his hair was still gone. But my friend's, my friend, my best friend's dad, he is from Jordan. So he has this really thick Arab accent. And he had been, hey, Armando, how is Sevi? And I said, he's doing better. He's going to recover. It's looking good. And he, he looked at me, and he just goes, we serve the living God, not like the other gods who are dead, and they're deaf, and they're blind. We serve the living God. And he hears our cries, and he hears our prayers, and he answers us, and he works miracles. And I went, preach it, brother. Like, come on. Keep it coming. But he, he said, we serve the living God. And I went, almost like it was foreign to my ears. And it caused me to get stirred up. I got goosebumps right now telling you guys that because he was so passionate about it. But that's the reality that we live in. We serve the living God. And what Isaiah wants the people of Israel to look at, you're trusting in that temple. You're trusting in this land. You think because your fathers are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that you can trust in that. God doesn't want you to trust in that. He wants you to trust in him. And everything that you're looking at is going to be shaken. Why? Because the kingdom of God is unshakable. Notice what he says again, it's established, the unmovable kingdom of God, where he is seated on his throne, ruling over the kingdoms of the world. We see the world shaking around us, countries closing borders, stay-at-home orders. We are more fragile than we know, but the kingdom of God is not fragile. The kingdom of God cannot be shaken because the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords sits upon that throne. And we have to be reminded, this is the kingdom we are a part of. That this mountain, as it will be established, and as the kingdom of God will be placed upon it, as Hebrews 12, 28 says, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us give thanks, by which we offer to God an acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For indeed, our God is a consuming fire. I love that. A kingdom that cannot be shaken. Everything else can, but not that kingdom. And notice how Isaiah says, he says it's going to be on the highest of mountains. If you've been to Jerusalem, where the temple, where the temple was supposed to be, where, where Abraham offered Isaac, where Solomon built his temple, where they built the second, where they built the second temple, it is not the highest mountain, even in Jerusalem. 
The Mount of Olives is higher. Actually, that's the best place to look at Jerusalem. It's from the Mount of Olives, and you look down on the temple. So what's the, what's the point of him saying it's going to be the highest? It's going to be the highest, because we'll see in a second, it's the, greatest, it's the greatest act of worship can be us worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, of the Messiah. There is no substitute on this earth for the pure worship to the pure king, and we have to re-recognize that. But this highest mountain, again, it's not, it's not, it's not the, the Temple Mount right now. But the Israelites viewed Zion as the superior place to worship in the ancient world. It was the superior place. I don't care what other temples there were, nothing matched. Why? Because God was there. The Shekinah glory, the manifestation of God on earth was in the temple. Think about that. Just think about that for a second. And you're out there in the temple knowing where God has placed his name That's where he's specially being worshiped. But look what Jesus says. Now, Jesus has come. Jesus has come. We can so much go, oh, that'd be so cool. I used to think that way. Oh, that'd be so cool. That'd be so incredible to be back at that time, to see that temple, to worship there. But here's the reality. We have better. We have better right now. Remember Jesus' conversation with the woman of Samaria? They get into this theological conversation with each other, and Jesus is talking to her. And he's answering her questions. Look what he says there. John 4, 21. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For the salvation is from the Jews. Notice what he says in verse 23. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. God gives us the deposit of his Holy Spirit within our hearts. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have the seal of the Holy Spirit within your hearts. So no matter where you are, you can worship the Lord. You don't have to go to Jerusalem. You don't have to come to church. You can be anywhere There's a song by R.E.M., and it says, a truck stop instead of St. Peter's. I don't know what he was talking about. I don't know what he meant by that. But when I heard it, it really stoked me because I thought, he's right. I could be in a truck stop, and it's just as good as St. Peter's. If you've ever been to Rome and you've seen St. Peter's, it's pretty magnificent. It is. It's a work of man, but it is. It's amazing. And when you have the works of, like, Michelangelo and Raphael as part of your decor... It's pretty good, right? It's pretty amazing. But I'm telling you right now, if we worship God in spirit and truth, it could be a dump, and that place is just as holy as St. Peter's itself. Why? Because we worship the Lord in spirit that he has given us and in the truth of his revelation. The revelation of his word, the revelation of his person. This is the reality that we have to live in. This is the, to be reminded of how we are to worship, that we are spiritual people, and we live in the truth of God's word, and we live in the truth of the reality that what? The Messiah has come. The Messiah has come. This is our reality. This is our truth. And we live in it, and we live it out in the world. But to be reminded of this, until so Father looks, he, he's, Jesus says, he's looking for those who will worship him in spirit and truth. Not in Jerusalem, Not here in Samaria, not there in Rome, not in Constantinople. Well, it's not that anymore. About a thousand years ago. No, it's here. It's in you. It's in me. This reality that we worship the Lord. And so when we come together and we worship the Lord, the power of worship when our hearts are really given to him. And again, we're looking back and we're seeing the church, early church is living in that reality, isn't it? And it turned the greatest nation in the world, it turned it on its ear. It turned it on its ear because they were living out this reality. They rejoiced in it. And I say, let's join them in rejoicing. Notice it says in verse two, it says, it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of mountains 
and shall be lifted up above the hills. And notice what it says next. And all nations shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. Notice that all nations are welcomed. All nations are welcomed. And think about this. If you're an Israelite there in Jerusalem, are you even thinking about the other nations? Do you even care about the other nations? The Moabites, the Malachites, well, they're pretty much wiped out. The Egyptians, Babylon. No, you don't care. Look at Joel, um, the prophet uh, Joel. No. The whale. Jonah. Thank you. I don't know why I said thinking Joel. Jonah. That's, I would say this. He's a reflection of most of those in his nation. He's the embodiment, that embitterment, that prejudice, that hatred. He, they, God singles him out, but I think he reveals the heart of the nation through him, the prophet. Jonah, you see it in him. But yet, Isaiah's going, man, I'm telling you, the time is coming, the time is coming when all nations shall flow into the house of God. And can you imagine that? I, they would hear it and then just be like, I don't know what he's talking about. I don't know what he's talking about. But yet, it was given to Abraham, wasn't it? There in, in Genesis chapter 12, through you, all the nations of the world shall be blessed. All the families of the earth shall be blessed. So it was already foretold to Father Abraham. But then it's the fulfillment is Jesus. Look what Jesus says in Matthew 28, 19. Go ahead and put that one up if it's there. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Here's the thing. How are all nations going to flow in? That should be your question. How are all nations, every tribe and tongue, how are they going to flow in? We go to those nations, and we tell them the good news of Jesus Christ. That's how God has given us the invitation. We are those people that go to our neighbors and to other countries, and we tell them the good news of Jesus Christ. But here's the thing we forget. And I would go as far as saying this. Sometimes we become so nationalistic that we take on the heart of Jonah. And we look at our countries around us, not as our neighbors, but as those that should be excluded. And we get, remember in the 80s, it was the Russians, right? Uh, the evil Russians. In the World War II, it was the Germans, it was the Japanese. Back when this country was established, it was the English, right? They're our enemy. And then we can go back in history and we see it over and over. I mean, if you go to any country in this world, they'll tell you who their enemy is. But as Christians, all we have is neighbors. We don't have enemies. We have an invitation, the invitation of the King of Kings saying, come, come into his kingdom. Come, let us go up to the house of the Lord. All nations shall flow in. And the fulfillment of this is in Revelation, isn't it? Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. John tells us there, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number. I love that. You couldn't even number it. For every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands. Can you believe that? I was in Van Nuys years ago at a church. And again, Van Nuys is very multi-ethnic. You know, we live, we, we live in areas where it's either you're all this or all that or whatever, but there it's just a hodgepodge. And I sat there and it was a men's conference. And I would say this, every tribe and every tongue that was in Van Nuys was represented in that place of worship. And there was 1,500 men of every color, every eye shape, right? And we all worship the Lord. And I sat there and I went, this is what heaven's going to look like. With girls. The girls will be there too, right? <laughs> Add the girls in. But this is what it's going to look like. God is so good. But our hearts have to be open to that. Our hearts have to be open. But so often, we're like Ebenezer Scrooge, where he was closed off to everyone, wasn't he? Didn't matter. If you were poor, if you were rich, he just hated you. Our hearts have to be opened up to where we want to love everybody. Notice what I said, to where we want to love everybody. That's the first step. We got to desire it. We got to be third. That's the very first step. And then after that, we will love all. 
But all nations are flowing in. Why? Because of what Jesus has done. He's made the way possible. Paul said he's taken the two and he's made them one, Gentile and Jew. He tore down the wall that was between them and they become one flesh. This is what Jesus has accomplished. What Isaiah saw, the only way it's going to happen is when the church lives in that reality. When we live out the beautiful invitation that Christ has wrought with his own blood. And he says, now go therefore, go therefore into all nations and tell them this wonderful news and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And if you keep reading that, and back in Matthew, he says, make disciples. So there's going to be a relationship, isn't there? We just don't go in there, give, give the gospel and say, later, we're out. No, we go and we disciple. That way, as Paul did with Timothy and Titus, they become family. They become family. Because this is what Christ has come to do. All nations are welcomed. All nations are welcomed. And now notice what it says there in verse 3. Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He may teach us his ways that we may walk in his, in the, his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. The thing I want to see are just really three things. It's, the invitation is to all nations because he's truly the desire of all nations. See, we get confused with our hungers and our thirst, and we think that another figure, another religious leader, another prophet, whatever it might be, a philosopher, and we are hungry. But here's the thing. We're hungry for something. We are. We have a spiritual hunger deep within us, deep with longing. But as we see when Christ comes, and he is the bread of life, right? He is the living water, when we recognize that, we take him to the nations to satisfy that hunger and to satisfy that thirst because he is the desire of the nations. He is the desire. And notice what it says there again. I love this. It says, come, let us go. They're hungry to go. They're hungry to go. They want to go be in the Lord's presence. And if you look at Matthew chapter 11, verse 12, I think we have it, yeah. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence and the violent take it by force. Now you could read that and say that's a negative thing. It's not negative. It's a very positive thing. The leper, right? Matthew chapter eight. Remember that guy? Remember this. This is right after the Sermon on the Mount. So there's thousands of people surrounding Jesus. Thousands. And remember, if you had leprosy, you were supposed to say, unclean, unclean. And they, the, the, the neighborly people that they were, they get rocks and throw them at you. Get out of here, right? Well, if you have COVID now, get out of here. You had COVID. Get out, where's your mask? Whatever it might be. You see, I had friends of mine, like, dude, at work, because I had COVID, no one even talks to me anymore. I said, come on, stop it. He goes, bro, I'm serious. I might as well have the death plague on me. And I'm like, I'm cured. Yeah, sure you are, buddy. You had it. And he's like, people just stay away. They're scared of him. He eats lunch alone, but whatever. But I want to see, that's kind of in our nature, right? But this guy with leprosy was so, so full of hope. I really believe this. I would love to see. This would be one scene I would love to see. So I kept going, how did this guy get through the crowd? How did he get through the crowd to get to Jesus? Can you imagine that? You guys ever been to a concert? Crowd? It's like a crowd. Been around a celebrity? Crowd? right? Sardines packed in. And this guy with leprosy must have gone, hey, I got leprosy. And they're saying, get out of here. And he's saying, no, you get out of here. And he, you see him just walking forward. And you can see those people parked like the Red Sea. And he gets to Jesus and he falls down and he says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And what does Jesus tell him? I am willing. And he touched him and he was clean. That's the violent hope Matthew's talking about. John started this movement by preaching this radical milk toast message of repent for the kingdom of God's at hand, right? It was hardcore and he wasn't messing around. He had no time to play because the Messiah is coming. People started having hope because God had not spoken in over 400 years. Light shined into the darkness. And I'm telling you right now, I believe this in my whole heart, the world is becoming a darker place on every level. We have light. But here's the thing, they're hungry to go. 
They're hungry to be in God's presence. And here's the thing. I, don't know, I know all of us have our seasons, right? Where it's easy to have devotions. It's easy to pray. It's easy to, you know, um, sit there and read the word. It's just easy. But then you have those other seasons where you have no hunger. You have no desire. You don't want to go. No, my answer to us is when we have those seasons, grind it. Grind it. Do it anyways. Don't, don't clock yourself because you used to pray for an hour and a half. Don't clock yourself because it was easy to pray or it was easy to read the word. Just read the word. Just read it. Feed your soul. Pray for five minutes. Great. Pray for five minutes. But go. Go. If I said tomorrow, Jesus, Jesus in body form is going to be in Fallbrook. Would you go? Would you go? I think we would. I hope so. I, hope, I don't know. I have to mow the lawn. Is he going to be here after I mow the lawn? I got to go shopping. I got to decorate the house. Jesus wants to speak to you. Well, kind of busy tomorrow. Uh, can we reschedule? That would never be our attitude. So at least I hope not. You would drop everything. Hey, he does already speak to us. He already does want to be with you. He wants to be with me. Like I told you, my youth pastor used to kick his daughter's crib. His wife would warn him, don't you wake her up. I won't, I promise. And he would kick her crib. And then she'd start crying. Oh, the baby's crying, baby. I'll get her, I'll get her. And he would just hold his daughter. And then one day the Lord spoke to his heart. That's me every morning with you. I can't wait to spend time with you. Go. I mean, you look at their excitement. Come, let us go up. Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. There's a hunger to go, and it's a violent hope within us that we will not allow anything, any obstacle to get in our way, any fear, any doubt. We push it aside because we know God is gracious. We know God loves us. We know he calls us by name. So we have this within our hearts. So we go with the hope, the hope that he will speak, with the hope that he will accept because he does even if it's just a little bit of hope, like the prodigal son. He just had a little bit of hope, but that hope made him go, and he had the surprise of his life, didn't he? The surprise of his life. And notice what else it says. That he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. They have a hunger to learn. Remember what John, Peter said in John when everybody else is leaving Jesus there in John chapter 6, and Jesus looks to his disciples and he says, are you going to depart also? And what does Peter say? Where else can we go, Lord? You alone have words of eternal life. And I'm, I'm telling you right now, there's so, there's so much out here right now through multimedia, through our computers, through the television, through the radio. We have messages bombarding us. And I'm telling you, 99% of them are not the teachings of Christ. They're not. But they tickle our ears. And they, they stoke our pride. And we justify it. Instead of bringing that teaching under the gaze of God's word, we allow it to distract us and push us away. But the beauty of this is they want to go. Why? Because they know he has the words of eternal life. Words of eternal life. The teachings of eternal life. What does that mean? See, our eternal life doesn't start when we get to the Lord's presence. It already started. It already started. And it's a lifestyle that's countercultural to the world that is around us. It's a value system that turns the world's value system upside down. It's a richness that does not show up in our bank accounts, but it shows up in our hearts and in our lives and in our relationships with others. This is what it is to have eternal life. And they, they're hungry. Come, let us go and learn. Because here's the thing, I don't know about you guys. Maybe I'll talk to you guys as men. If you have kids, was it natural for you to be a dad? It's not natural for me. I feel like I'm going in blind half the time. I don't know how to be a great dad. I just don't want to jack up my kids. That's my biggest fear. I don't want to ruin them. I definitely don't want to be my dad. But what am I supposed to be? Because he's the only dad I've ever seen. Well, 
what I've learned, I go to the Word and I live out my Word with my kids. Not out of pride, but in humility. Not giving them law, but giving them grace. Well, they need to know. They need, they need to know they're going to be punished. There's no time for that when they're small. But you try to spank a six-year-old? Does that work? Yeah, it'll knock you out, man, right? But, man, if you do it God's way, he has a way of building bridges. Building bridges where there is none. And he has a way of, of, of the kids giving you respect without you demanding it. I don't understand it. I don't. I'm not here to tell you, that. oh, well, this is the wisdom from Armando. No, this is what I've learned. And I trip out because it works. It just works. I don't get it, though. I just obey. Thank goodness I don't have to take a test. Because God would be like, what did you learn? Oh, well, uh, in this situation, I did this. And in that situation, I did that. And was, this was a firm hand here, but man, this was a gracious hand, even though this was way worse. But God said, just give him grace. All right, I'll give him grace. But we learn how to live our lives with the eternal values of the kingdom. Because see, most of us, we, we live our lives with short-term consequences in mind. Just short term. We don't dare to look beyond that to see how will this affect my relationship with them 10 years from now? Five years from now? Tomorrow even? We're very short term minded. But when we look at things through the eternal gaze of God, when we look through the eternal eyes of God, then it's a long marathon. Then what happened right now is really not that big in the context of a lifetime. Do you see what I'm saying? And if I take the eternal values of God and I put them into practice now in the temporal things of my life, it brings eternal value to it. Eternal value to the relationship. Eternal value in what I'm communicating to them. Not short term, long term. Because again, there's times where I want to give punishment. <clears throat> punishment. And God says, no, give them grace and then watch them repent. Because what do I really want? Do I want them to be punished or do I want them to repent? See what I'm saying? Natural Armando, punish, punish, punish. That's me. <laughs> That's me. That's my first go-to. Spank them. You know, discipline them. But God in me, give them grace and then watch them repent. I want repentance. I want repentance. What does that mean? I want them to stop doing what they're doing. Not just to be punished for what they're doing, I want them to stop doing what they're doing. And I believe this. We go before the Lord and we remember we're there to learn, not to memorize. If you're going to memorize it just to memorize it, is that really going to help you? <sighs> but if you go there to learn the spirit of it. Because remember, John, John and James, they didn't know what spirit they were of. The Pharisees knew the letter of the law. They didn't know the spirit that it was written in. And so many Christians never get to that point. We just make it black and white. We make it harsh. And yet that doesn't reflect Jesus, does it? Jesus is loving and he's patient long term. We go and we learn. We learn about eternal life. And here's the thing, we hunger to live it. We hunger to live it out. Psalm 86.11, or yeah, Psalm 86.11, teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth, unite my heart to fear your name. Unite my heart to fear your name. And here's the picture of it. Remember Zacchaeus, you guys? Zacchaeus, the tax collector, remember that story? He was a, he was a total con man. He would totally rip you off, right? If you owed, you know, 10, he was going to charge you 20. Why? He needed his cut. I need, to take, I need to take my cut to pay off the Romans, and I needed to make some money on this too, so we'll just double it. We'll double the tax. But what happens when Jesus goes into his house? Do you guys remember what happens? He begins to live out the eternal teachings of Christ. Do I have that verse there? I hope I do. As the, yeah, Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. Awesome. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I'll restore it fourfold. And then Jesus says, today salvation has come in, uh, to this house since he is also a son of Abraham. Salvation is seen how? Fire insurance? Is, is that kids just have fire insurance? No, salvation comes and it sets him free from the idol of money in his life. 
He served money. He lived for money. He defrauded for money. He lied for money. He served money. But the moment he comes into contact with the Messiah, Jesus, he is set free. Salvation is revealed in the fact that he accepts Christ, but it's also revealed in the fruit that comes out. He gives up half to the poor, half, think about that, and then fourfold, he pays back everybody. Why? Because he would say, I'm saved. Salvation has come. This, what is this? I have what I've been looking for my whole life, and it's Jesus. That's the power of the Messiah. Has this power touched your heart? Have you melted in his presence? Melted. That he comes, and he, he's like, I know you love this. I know you love this, Zacchaeus. I know you love money. I know you do. I want to set you free. And Zacchaeus says, so be it. And God opens his heart, and he sets him free. Salvation has come. He, like, I love what they say there. It says, um, teach us your ways that we may walk in your paths. See, when you get saved, it's not just to have this insurance for heaven. To come to walk with the Lord is to learn how to live a life that reflects his life. Every day, where bigotry and racism melt, where judgment of others that aren't living a moral life, you have sympathy and compassion for them. Why? Because that's what Jesus has. You don't live your life under this law, this, this cloud of the law. You live your life in the light of Jesus light of Jesus. And it's beautiful. And I believe this as we look at Advent and we look back to what was promised and we see what has been manifested through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we long, we long for him to come back. Oh, Maranatha, Maranatha. Then it says this, verse four, he shall judge between the nations and he and shall decide disputes for many peoples, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Only one nation in this world has no army. Only one. Iceland. They have no, no, no national army at all. You know what's crazy about Iceland? Mothers leave their babies in the strollers outside while they go into the store and shop. That's how safe Iceland is. Like, so those, the, the, the women here are like, oh, heck no. I'm not going to leave my baby out there. They do, they, they picture like they're lined up like little cars. You know, like the, the, the strollers, because mom's in the store shopping. But that's how safe it is there. I wonder if it's a reflection of the fact that they don't invest in an army. The early church, the early church, you guys, they were pacifists. They were. Maybe it's because they were all slaves in the Roman Empire. Maybe they knew it was because it was to be oppressed. Maybe that's why they wanted nothing to do with it. My, you know, my uncle fought in Vietnam. He was, a, he was a special forces. He was a ranger. Big time, a lot of engagements in his life. About a week or so before he died, him and I were just talking, and he told me this. He was a monitor for years. I saw the faces of those of my friends who had died, and of the people that I had killed in battle. Because when I came back from Nam, he, three, three tours of duty in Nam, he goes, when I came back, I went hunting one day with a friend of mine. We shot a deer, we groomed it, and he goes, and I told my friend, gave him my rifle, says, I'll never pick up one of these again. And he told me this before he died, he goes, and I, I'll, I never saw the need for a gun again in my life. Because he saw what it had inflicted on other people. That was his experience. And this is not against the Second Amendment. I'm not saying that. I'm just talking about when you look at what you come and you bring your dispute before the Lord. Think about this. And I'm talking about any dispute with your spouse, with your parent. And you do what God tells you to do. It's the way of peace. They're peace lovers. The early church were peace lovers. Oh, they're weak. No, they're actually strong. And I think, look at that. I love it because they come before the Lord as judge and say, hey, you know, Lord, that wife you gave me, remember her? 
Well, she did A, B, and C. And the Lord says, well, I'll tell you what. Why don't you serve her? Why don't you forgive her? Why don't you love her? And then I take that anger. Instead of having a weapon, it's now a tool to bring life. A tool to bring life. The day is coming when Jesus Christ comes back. There's going to be no more war. None. Think about that, because all we've known in this last century is war. World War I, World War II. We just go all down the list of war after war after war, right? The day is coming there'll be no more war. The day is coming where nations will, put, will beat their instruments of war into instruments that bring life. Because God, God is in their midst. I love it. I love it. Again, God is the judge. He's the center of etern- international justice. God's sovereignty over all things will be acknowledged. God's sovereignty over all things will be acknowledged. God's will will be accomplished among all nations. Think about that. And I believe this. It starts with my own life. Is God's sovereignty evident in my own life? That I'm trusting him with tomorrow. I'm trusting him with yesterday. And I'm trusting him right now. Because he is over everything. And as we live that way, it does overflow into the world around us. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. The teaching of Jesus. Most happy are those who are peacemakers. And I'll say this, I would would encourage you this, as brothers and sisters in Christ, this is our call. In the midst of division, in the midst of anger, in the midst of hatred, our job is not to take sides, our job is to be peacemakers in it. Our job is to be the ones who are sober-minded, eternally minded. Christ conquered our hearts, and now we live for the peace that he died to give us. And we live to, we live to have it out. And the crazy thing about it is, in my, my, in my family, because I'm the pastor in my bigger family, my cousins come to me. And they're like, hey, you know, you need to talk to so-and-so because they're having this feud. And you, why me? You know, I'm like, why? Well, because you're the Christian and you're this. And that, thank you. I take that as a compliment. Sure, I'll call them. Sure, I'll pray with them. Sure, I'll pray for them. And I call them. And then right away, oh, you're, you're calling me because of what happened with my blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I am calling. What's that all about? What's going on, man? Blessed are the peacemakers. They shall be called the sons of God. We live in a world, blessed are those who create drama. They will have the most likes on Facebook. Right? Blessed are the controversial. They'll have more followers on Twitter. That's the world we live in now. Blessed are the peacemakers. There's not too many of those. They shall be called the sons of God because they are communicating the heart of God. Then it says this in the very end. I love it. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. John 8, 12, and Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You would think, well, why doesn't the world walk in the light? John tells us because they, their deeds are dark and they'd rather dwell in darkness. When we come to the light of Jesus Christ, again, I'll say this a million times, we live a transparent life. We live a life of humility. We live a life of vulnerability. We live a life where we're not faking to be perfect. We're not living a life where we act like we have it all together because we don't. But he does. He does have it all together. And he holds me all together. What would your life look like if I took Jesus out of it? If I took your marriage, if I took your life and just ripped Jesus out, what would it look like? I hope there'd be like just dramatic change because he's so much part of your life. I had a friend of mine, he has a doctorate from Yale in philosophy, and he told me one day, he gets angry at me because I'm a believer. He just thinks it's irrational and it's stupid. And he goes, I want you to do something. I have a challenge for you. I said, what? He goes, I want you not to pray for five days. Just don't pray for five days. Don't read your Bible and don't pray. And I go, well, what's that going to accomplish? He goes, I want you to see how insignificant that is in your life. I thought about it for a minute. And I go, bro, I can't do it. It's like, why not? I'm like, that'd be like you tell me, don't talk to your best friend. I just can't do it. 
I talk to him all the time. I, I think I'll go crazy. I just think I would. <laughs> I'm always talking to him about everything, just kind of talking to him about it. I've gotten used to it. He goes, oh, no, you're just, you're just not being rational. I'm like, well, how long do you try praying for five days and see how it changes? Let's just, turn, let's just turn the tables here. You pray for five days. After you pray for five days, then you come back and tell me not to pray for five days. No, I don't want to do that. Okay, then, touche. Let Jesus to walk in his light, the light of his grace, that you finally go before somebody who knows every secret, every failure, every heartbreak, every sin, every harsh word, everything you, we try to hide, and but he, we stand before him. And he, he, we don't get, like, we're like Noah. I love this verse, the New King James Version, but it says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You know, if you look at somebody who should be mad at you and angry at you, and you're like waiting for those fiery eyes to come and look at you, you look at Jesus with all my, all my mess, I go before him with all my mess, and I'm kind of like just wincing, waiting for that condemnation, waiting for that judgment, and I look up at him, and I find grace in his eyes and a smile and the invitation, just come in. Just come in. We walk in the light of who he is and who we are in light of him. We walk in the light. My hope this Advent season, that this season will help to rekindle in you afresh the joy of the coming of the Christ. To rekindle this passion and hunger for his presence. That's already there. He's with us. He hasn't left us. But that we have recognized it and live, out, live that in the joy of all that he brings. All that he brings all that he brought, and all that he's going to bring. What is that? Christmas past, Christmas present, and Christmas future. Let's bow our hearts in prayer as we get ready for communion. Father, as we come before you, Lord, we long for the day where the mountain of the Lord will be established among us. Your throne is unshakable. We are part of an unshakable kingdom. I pray, Lord, that we live our lives in the reality of that. Lord, we pray that by your spirit, meet us at your table as we look back on what you accomplished on Calvary and what you promise in your kingdom, Lord, that you're going to sit with us from the east, from the west, from the north, from the south. Many will come and sit with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Lord, that's us. You were talking about us, Lord. Many, we're part of the many that will come. And it's going to be such a glorious day. We'll look upon you with our own eyes, as Job said. And we'll eat this supper with you. Whew, Lord, it's, it's overwhelming to think of it. But Lord, we all long for it. So give us a little taste this morning, we pray. Father, we ask it in Jesus' name. Everybody said? There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies.
And there's a place with sin and shame, a powerless. Where my heart has peace with God and forgiveness. Where all the love I ever found comes like a flood, comes flowing down. And at the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in all of you. they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Let us eat the bread now together. And he took a cup And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let us drink the cup now together. And all God's people said, amen. Stand up. Well, God bless you guys. I hope you uh, get your houses all decorated for Christmas. I'll probably do it in a couple weeks, but you guys could do it this week if you like. Now, my daughter will get me going pretty soon. Uh, but again, I just want to encourage you guys, remember, he's coming back. And we live our lives in the reality of that. We live our lives in the reality that he's come and that he's conquered death. And he's paid for our sin. And nothing can separate us from his love. We live our lives in the reality of that. Now receive your blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So shall they put my name upon the people of Israel, Calvary Fallbrook, and I will bless them. You know what God's people said? Amen. Amen. Give somebody a hello and a hug before you go. God bless you guys.